Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. You know what's even better? Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. You know what's even better than that? Not having the dishwasher going on in the background. I'm hoping that my, all the trickery that I do uh, takes away all that noise in the background. Anyway. Let's get, let's move on. Welcome to Freestyle Friday, where I get to do what I want. Time for more how the sausage or wine is made videos. No BS, just straight talk about how wine is made. I'm going to strip away the romance and pull back the curtain, if you will. Be that anonymous magician that shows you how the magic trick is done. Not to put down how wine is made or shame anyone. This is just the reality of wine. So last time I described what biodynamic farming is. Just to recap, it's based on organic farming with the total absence of, very, of the very few organic synthetic products that organic farming allows. Instead, it relies on products ideally made on the winery's property like composts and sprays using various ingredients also associated with homeopathic medicine cured in various animal parts. It also uses an astrological calendar of sorts to help determine functions in the vineyard. Remember that the ancients used the technically lunar solar ca calendar uh, that was based upon uh, the stars and the moon and the sun and everything and how all that integrated. So they used all that for much of their agriculture. So Bio is doing something similar here. Today we are going to talk about the wine that comes from biodynamic farming. Kind of like the organic winemaking episode, there won't be a lot of extra details. Biodynamic winemaking's goal is to not mess too much with the wine. They will still give it help along the way. Okay, so I have a vineyard and a winery and I want to make biodynamic wine. How do I get certified? Are there government regulations about all this? For the second question, no. There is no legal definition when it comes to wine for the term biodynamic. As far as certification, it pretty much boils down to the international organization called Demeter, or also maybe pronounced Demeter. <laughs> anyway, there are quite a few companies that do biodynamic certification but they are all effectively tied to Demeter. In Europe, there is another organization called Biodivin. Bio Biodivin, I think is how it's pronounced. They have members in France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Switzerland, and Germany, but almost all are in France. Italy has five, and the rest of the countries only have one each. They have a total of 175 member wineries. This is as of 2021, uh, August or September when I looked it all up. And so both organizations seem to have very similar rules to get certified, but Biodivin actually does a tasting of your wine yearly to ensure the wine meets their standards. EcoCert is who they use for the certification process. I don't recall ever reading in Demeter's website or in the regulations, so I didn't, I didn't go every line by line. I don't remember them ever doing tasting, but you do have to show that you're, you're following their, their uh, practices. I should also mention that while Demeter is the overarching organization, there are a lot of companies that do the actual certification. They just all follow Demeter's standards. So what does Demeter require to be certified? The following is a summary version of their document as it is very detailed and long. This is why I didn't read the entire thing top to bottom for like looking for the tasting part. But anyway, when it comes to wine, it includes must meet Demeter's farm standard. Effectively, the vineyard, the entire vineyard, must be organically farmed. Now remember, technically, there are some organically derived synthetic fertilizers and pesticides that can be used on an organic farm. From what I can tell, Demeter does not allow this. This farm standard really looks at the entire operation to ensure it's an integrated organism, not just an organic vineyard in a winery using conventional winemaking techniques. There needs to be a biodiversity of plants, animals, flowers, trees, water, etc., with a minimum of 10% of the land devoted to this. Composting is a key element. At least 90% of the grapes must be Demeter certified as biodynamic. 
No GMOs allowed at any point, grapes, additives, yeast, etc. They encouraged the use of the biodynamic calendar to determine harvest dates, other vineyard activities, and cellar work. Hand harvesting is preferred, but not required. You do have to justify mechanical harvesting, however. Ideally, grape pomace and seeds need to be composted. Processing aids, also known as additives, must be certified organic or biodynamic, or approved by Demeter. No pasteurization or concentration of must. Must use native yeast, or yeast the winery develops itself. Basically, you can't buy yeast except in certain cases and must be approved by Demeter, and it has to be non-GMO. No adjusting of acid or sugar. Sugar addition is allowed in the case of sparkling wine to create the second fermentation in the bottle. However, in their list of approved additives, things like potassium bicarbonate are fine for wine. This is a way to reduce acidity, so take these adjustments with a grain of salt. Oak and oak alternatives are allowed, but must not dominate the wine. Cold stabilization is allowed. This is that common technique that helps eliminate those wine diamonds that can appear in a white wine or collect on the cork of a red or white wine. These diamonds or crystals are harmless and are actually tartaric acid precip precipitating out of the wine. I discussed this a couple episodes ago. Only certain types of filters are allowed, including one that is a type of plastic. The maximum SO2 is 100 parts per million. All equipment must be such that it cannot contaminate the grapes or the wine in any way, including ensuring there is no residue of cleaning solutions. Some equipment like barrels and tanks must have some way to identify them and their contents. You must keep detailed records of everything, plus a list of 24 other requirements that are all for, that are for all biodynamic products. I included a couple in this list. This was for a certified biodynamic wine. However, you can have a wine that's not biodynamic, but uses certified biodynamic grapes. Grapes must meet the USDA's Made with Organic Grape Standard and be 100% certified biodynamic by Demeter. Agricultural additives and processing aids such as eggs, milk, and sweeteners must be certified organic at a minimum. You must use a winery that is certified by Demeter and provide documentation to support this along with a label. I interpret this as being a situation where, let's say, I have a winery that's not Demeter certified, but I have a Demeter certified vineyard I own or purchase Demeter certified fruit. While I can't make the wine in my winery, I can make it in another winery. This may sound weird, but there are actually a lot of regular wines that don't have an actual winery. It's just a name, and they use another winery to make their wines. All right, organic yeast should be used if available. A bit, of, a bit of an out, but it's similar to the USDA's requirement for using organic yeast unless there's not an organic version of the strain you want to use. Must adhere to Demeter's 90-70% rules. 70% of the grapes must be certified biodynamic for this category. No GMOs allowed at any point, grapes, additives, yeast, etc. So you can use commercial yeast, just not GMO commercial yeast plus a list of 24 other requirements that are for all biodynamic products. I included a couple in this list also. So there's a lot there to do in order to become certified biodynamic. And this is only an overview of everything required. It would take an entire video or like five to detail every requirement. For the most part, you really can't do any adjustments. The potassium bicarbonate thing though for wine is allowed. But no mega purple, no cryer maceration, no flash detente, no reverse osmosis, etc. You can temperature control the fermentation. Now, if you have a stuck fermentation, then you are allowed to use a commercial yeast and still be compliant with 100% biodynamic, if I understand the rules correctly. In the case of a stuck fermentation, you have a pretty simple form to fill out called the Rescue Yeast Culture Approval Form. Rescue yeast is the yeast you use to fix a stuck fermentation. Besides some basic information, you need to provide the following information. So, variety, grape variety, the bricks at harvest, that's the sugar content, the bricks level now, I'm assuming that now mean the, at the stuck fermentation, the bricks change over the past few days, total YANC at harvest, if applicable, I'll get what that is, 
yeast nutrient used and rate that's in pounds per, per thousand gallons or kilogallons. Yeast must be a neutral yeast. So if you remember from my conventional winemaking episode, you can buy yeast that will enhance certain things about a wine or even cider or beer, honestly. But you can't use a yeast that's going to do that. It's just, it just has to ferment the wine. Just get the fermentation going. No, no enhancements. Now, you need to give reasons as to why you think the fermentation stuck. You also have to attach a copy of your fermentation log and documentation that you're using a non-GMO, non-synthetic yeast. These cannot be grown on a petrochemical substrate or sulfite waste liquor. Yeah, I don't know what that last part means either. What I can tell you is Y-A-N-C is. It's also called Y-A-N. Y-A-N-C stands for one of two different things. Yeast assimilable nitrogen combined. I also have seen yeast assimilable nitrogenous compounds. Okay. Drop the combined, drop the C and you, for, and you get uh, Y-A-N. So you just get yeast assimilable nitrogen. So I didn't specifically talk about this in the conventional winemaking episode, but I've implied the need for this measurement during the course of these videos in the form of mentioning yeast nutrients. I think I mentioned like once or twice. This figure mentioned this figure measures three different sources of nitrogen: free uh, amino nitrogen, ammonia, and ammonium. After the fermentable sugars, glucose and fructose, nitrogen is the most important nutrient for wine. Not enough, and you can have everything from a fermentation ending earlier than your target dryness to a full on stuck fermentation. Too much nitrogen can also spell disaster for a wine. This can create a breeding ground for, other, for another kind of yeast called Brettanomyces, or Brett. This is what gives us those off smells of barnyard or band-aid. Not uncommon in some parts of France where it's considered a characteristic as long as it's not too much. It can also allow a not so desirable bacteria called Acetobacter to form. This is what gives us acetate. We associate that with nail polish remover or just straight up vinegar. When we talk about VA or volatile acidity, we mean this. In Italy, this is somewhat common. Not as common in other countries in Europe, but it can be found in other European countries too. Like Brett, in small amounts, it's fine. It can also encourage lactic acid bacteria or LAB, but LAB is a good thing too. So it depends on what's going on, but yes, we need LAB for almost all red wine and for a lot of white wine to have mallow lactic fermentation to happen, hence the lactic acid bacteria. In both primary and secondary fermentation, you need to monitor your YAN or else spoilage problems can occur. So this is where the nutrient thing comes into play. A nutrient called diammonium phosphate or DAP or DAP is used to supplement nitrogen. You'll do this along with adding other micronutrients to the must to ensure a good fermentation. The thing is, DAP is not mentioned at all in their list of approved additives, but the form shows that something like DAP would be allowed in this case. DAP is the most common nutrient to be used just in winemaking period. When you get a stuck fermentation due to not enough YAN or YAN or other nutrients, this is where a rescue yeast comes to the, well, rescue. <laughs> Commercially available non-GMO rescue yeast is what would be used in the case of a biodynamic wine's fermentation being stuck. Another thing to highlight is the use of oak. This includes oak alternatives like chips and powder. The key thing here is that the oak cannot dominate the wine. We've gotten so used to these oaky wines that sometimes it's all you taste. Things like vanilla, cloves, cinnamon, roasted coffee, smoke, coconut, dill, baking spices, etc. These can enhance the flavor and aromas of wine. But sometimes, many times, winemakers take it to the limit. You'll hear sometimes that their grapes are high quality enough or some other metric that they can handle the oak. Okay, whatever you say, man. I'm not saying that 100% new oak can't be well integrated, but there is a balance between how much new oak and second, third, or more, or second, third use or more oak can be used in a wine. When it's a lot, you can even feel like you're smelling bourbon. You'll hear us say something like whiskey lactones to describe judicious use of oak. Depending on your preference, you may like it. 
This is where the trend of aging a wine in used bourbon barrels and other used spirits barrels must have come from. Scotch has been doing it forever by aging, aging scotch in old sherry casks. So I guess turnabout's fair play. So yeah, you're not going to get a bourbon barrel aged biodynamic wine or even one with a ton of new oak, or you shouldn't. Oak has been called by many people the equivalent of makeup. It can either enhance the wine or hide problems with the wine. So remember I made a somewhat of a big deal about the biodynamic calendar last time? where we realized that it's not an absolute requirement. Even Rudy from Montenor said that he uses it as a guideline. While I haven't talked to a ton of biodynamic winemakers, almost all of them have a similar stance on the calendar. They don't necessarily put 100% faith in the calendar, but, they're, but it's there and they feel there's at least some credence to paying attention to it. This seems to be fairly common. It's an additional tool to use. Another thing is to ensure no cross-contamination of equipment between biodynamic and non-biodynamic functions. Organic has, uh, has a similar thing too. It makes sense that if you have equipment coming into contact with non-organic grapes, that it needs to be properly cleaned and sanitized. But you also need to make sure that whatever you're using to do this is also approved, or if it's something on the forbidden list as far as contact with the grapes or other organic ingredients, that there's no residue. Let's switch back to the vineyard again. One thing I have yet to mention with biodynamic is irrigation. It's allowed. You have to follow certain practices, but nothing crazy from what I read. Of course, local laws regarding irrigation need to be followed. I bring this up because irrigation gets a bad rap when there are plenty of wines made out there that follow very good practices that use irrigation. I won't go too deep into it, but yes, irrigation can be a sign of high volume, low quality grapes. But in many, many cases, it's used to ensure the quality of the grapes. Essentially, biodynamics really is a subset of organic farming with some, in my opinion, quirky beliefs. Do the wines taste good? I think so. So do organic wines and wines made from conventionally farmed grapes. In all these cases, you can have wine you like and wines you don't like. What sets organic and biodynamic wines apart from their conventionally farmed brethren is that organic and bio, at least on the surface, are more ecologically sound. However, multiple peer-reviewed studies talk about how there is no scientifically measurable difference in the composition of the soil when comparing organic and bio. There isn't just, this isn't just the chemical composition, but includes the biodiversity as well. The quote, organicness of the soil, if you will. The same applies to the wines. I saw one study mentioned where there was some slight physical differences in the grapes, but nothing that would change the wine after fermentation. Proponents of bio will tell you it's essentially all about the energy of the land, grapes, wines, etc. I get it. It's like crystals or chakras or auras. And in reality, none of these are measurable. It's taking something on faith. All of this is essentially the equivalent to, to religion where you rely on faith in something. And I'm not criticizing religion. I'm just pointing out that matters of faith are hard, if not impossible, to measure scientifically. When it comes to making the wine, the biodynamic winemakers do everything they can to not do anything they feel is artificial to the wine. They are avoiding highly manipulating the wine. I won't call it natural winemaking per se, but biodynamic can be a form of natural wine. But there's still some allowances to do things that a natural winemaker wouldn't probably do. Biodynamics, as far as I can tell, doesn't automatically equal sustainability. That's going to be a subject in a couple weeks, but essentially a sustainable wine is more than just the grapes or the winemaking, but also how the winery operates as a business. With that said, biodynamics is an overall philosophy of the winery, meaning all of the land it is on and the buildings as being one larger organism. So there needs to be a harmony of sorts. Is any one of these methods inherently better than the others? Well, I'll leave that question unanswered for now. I still have some more subjects to cover. Sustainable wines and associated farming inserts, regenerative farming and natural wines. While two of these are not farming methods, both almost always use either organic, biodynamic, or similar farming to make their wines. All right, so next time we'll cover regenerative farming, followed by sustainability, including a few other related certifications. I'll then wrap up with natural wines, and then I'll have one more episode that gives you my opinions about all of them. So that's gonna do it for this episode. I hope you got value from this episode. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe. And then until then, tell your friends.